Wisconsin Eye is at the Democratic Party State Convention in Wisconsin Dells interviewing U.S. Senator Tammy Baldwin. Senator, let's talk first about the news that just happened. Judge yes. Crabb's ruling invalidating the constitutional prohibition on same-sex marriage. Your reaction, Senator? Well, I think that Wisconsin today is a little more equal, not less, and that's something to celebrate. Uh, this decision will be very, very consequential for countless families across the state who um, want nothing more than to uh, be equal in the eyes of the law and to uh, be committed to the person that they love. And so I celebrate this decision and hope that the legal road ahead is a pretty clear path to making sure that um, that same-sex marriages are recognized in Wisconsin. What advice would you give same-sex couples who want to marry in Wisconsin in light of the ruling? And I say that, Senator, because uh, the Attorney General Van, Van Hollen just put out this uh, uh, statement, current law remains in force. So what, what, what should they do? Well, I have not read Judge Crabb's opinion. We're actually speaking literally minutes after it was released to the public. Um, and I'm very eager to see what she has said uh, in terms of direction to county clerks across the state. Um, but I imagine that they're going to be granting marriage licenses very soon. We've seen that happen in other states. And uh, I think that um, Certainly, uh, everybody who, every couple who has the intention of marrying is just waiting for this decision, ought to move forward. Does this, um, in other states, they've married and then there's been legal clouds over their marriage. Um, where does this put Wisconsin in the queue of the Oregon and Pennsylvanias? Isn't the uh, ultimate decision going to be uh, made by the U.S. Supreme Court? Well, if you think about what's been happening, you're right, there's a couple of states that have had recognition and then a bar on recognition followed by recognition. But the pattern over the last few months has been uh, quite clear. Almost every federal judge who has ruled on these cases has ruled that constitutional amendments banning uh, same-sex marriages are unconstitutional under the U.S. Constitution and most of the states are pretty readily uh, moving forward. So I certainly hope that's the case in Wisconsin and I hope that this is part of a chapter that will bring an end to these uh, these constitutional amendments uh, that really make our country less equal. As Wisconsin elects a governor and attorney general and eight members of the U.S. House and the state Senate and the state assembly, what campaign issue was created today by Judge Crabb's ruling, Senator? We well, you know it's interesting because of how this uh, issue has evolved in recent years. I think almost all of the candidates who are going to be on the ballot this fall have expressed their views of where they stand on this already. Uh, and so I don't think there's many gotchas left with regard to this. I know the gubernatorial candidates have spoken to this, although certainly we can hear some more, um, you know, some more comment uh, in reaction to the case. But I think the voters actually know where most of the candidates stand. The um, uh, J.B. Van Hollen has said he's going to appeal. Should he not in light of all the other rulings nationally, Senator? Well, I certainly hope that he uh, takes that into consideration and also looks at uh, the actions of some other Republican administrations. Now, I know that he and the governor are not one and the same, uh, but in uh, the state of Pennsylvania, uh, there was a conscious decision that it would likely be uh, uh, an expensive uh, proposition to appeal it. And also just a recognition that in many states since the voters voted on these constitutional amendments a number of years ago, that people's opinions have changed. And I think there's a yearning, again, to bring greater equality across the country. A new subject. You have worked awfully hard on the issue of student debt. Do you see Congress agreeing on a national uh, fix on that issue since the, the, the amount of debt now is how much? $1.2 trillion, $1 .2 trillion in trillion, aggregate student loan debt in the U.S. Which exceeds a lot of other credit card debt and... Yes, uh, it was about uh, two years ago that it surpassed credit card debt and it is really um, holding uh, students uh, or graduates back in the beginning of their careers when they have to contend with uh, starting a career, their first job, 
with, on average in Wisconsin, about $27,000, $28,000 in debt. It means that it's affecting their career choices. It means that it's affecting family choices, like when to get married and start a family. Mm -hmm. It means that uh, certain purchasing decisions are being delayed or deferred. Uh, do you buy a used car or a new car to go back and forth to work? Do you buy a home? Do you rent? Or do you move back in with your parents? And boy, I can tell you that happens a lot across the state and across this nation. This would be something so straightforward for Congress to confront, a refinancing package that would allow people who have incurred debt at various interest rates, including as up, up to as high as seven, eight, sometimes higher percent interest, and uh, refinance, consolidate at a much lower interest rate. The savings uh, to each student would be sizable and make a difference in their lives, but so would the aggregate impact across the economy. I'm hoping that my colleagues in both houses of Congress are recognizing the crisis that this is and what it means to future generations about whether they will have college aspirations. Uh, we can fight about how we'll pay for this, uh, and uh, right now the proposal is to use the Buffett rule. Um, I think that makes a lot of sense. In fact, I authored the Buffett rule bill when I served in the House of Representatives. But the idea that we are letting people who make over a million dollars a year pay at a lower tax rate because oftentimes part of their income comes from uh, their invested wealth, uh, that's, that's unfair. And I think that that would be a fair way to uh, make sure that uh, young people have a fair shot at a bright future. Under, if the Buffett rule were adopted, uh, that would not worsen the federal deficit, correct, Senator? We have just gotten a preliminary uh, fiscal report on the bill that is going to be considered by the Senate, we hope, next week. And when you uh, include the refinancing package along with the Buffett rule, there would actually be additional revenue that would go to pay down our national debt. I think that that is a fair proposition. You're one of a record 20 female senators, aren't you? Yes, I am. Talk to me about the synergy there, uh, because mm -hmm. I understood that um, that the unity among female senators is the reason that the U.S. acted on behalf of the kidnapped schoolgirls. Yet the same female senators couldn't quite agree on how to attack um, sex uh, assaults in the military. So what's the synergy? Well, um, let, me, uh, let me talk broadly. I, I would also credit the female senators for uh, ending the government shutdown. When everybody else was digging in their heels and being intransigent, there was a lot of discussion and useful ideas that um, ended up uh, causing a breakthrough that I think was so important for the American people. Um, and I would tell you that there is a very strong relationship among the 20 of us on a bipartisan basis. We uh, get together regularly. Um, we have a fix-it attitude of let's just get down to business. And I have to also say, uh, especially coming from the House of Representatives to the Senate, that there's such a strong contrast in terms of the number of my colleagues who are women who are in leadership posts. Mm -hmm. And Patty Murray was chair of the budget committee that had the breakthrough in, uh, in what has been gridlock on our budget uh, for many years and has our long-term fiscal health uh, in mind. Uh, Barbara Mikulski is chair of the appropriations committee, making sure that you know, bridges and roads are built and that important programs are funded. Debbie Stabenow chairs the Agriculture Committee, which reported out a farm bill that brings farmer security and makes sure that kids uh, have adequate nutrition in schools. Uh, on and on you see Senator Feinstein Senator the, Feinstein is chair of the Intelligence, Intelligence Committee, Committee and so crucial in terms of um, holding the administration to account and so all of these uh, women are doing remarkable things let me just say one word about the issue of sexual assault in the military because I think that I have to say, everyone in the media seems to love it when there's a conflict. Mm -hmm. There are seven women on the Senate Armed Services Committee. 
And they are unified, as are the rest of us who aren't on the committee, in making sure that serious steps are taken to combat a rampant problem in the military, sexual assault. Uh, in this past year, first of all in hearings when they had uh, commanding officers who were not responding appropriately, they cross-examined them, they brought out the issues, they figured out what policies needed to advance. I believe that 55 new individual policies have been adopted since I joined the Senate. There was disagreement over one of them. And of course that blew up to, oh, there's women senators who would take a different approach on one of these issues. On just one issue. It was only one issue. Excuse me. And, and I think it was a big issue of whether, uh, whether we should take decisions to prosecute military sexual assault out of the chain of command. Yes. It's a very consequential decision. Um, and we, you know, we had, I think, a bare majority, but not the 60 votes in, a, in the Senate that are necessary to pass that forward. But what I think is more important to recognize is that women stuck together on this and advanced four, 54 other policies uh, that were very important in terms of making sure that victims are not re-victimized in the process, um, getting rid of a lot of the, what was it, the good soldier defense of, well, that soldier is great on the battlefield, so we can't afford to prosecute them. These are things that were very problematic and adding to the problem, and they have been, um, at least the laws have been passed, now we have to see through to their implementation. If the Republicans gain six seats, they're going to gain control of the Senate. What's at stake if your party loses control of the U.S. Senate, Senator? Well, I have to say, um, with the Senate, obviously, you have that supermajority that's required to pass substantive legislation. Um, and so, you know, I don't see that much of a, a change in composition to, um, you know, to see all sorts of uh, bad proposals going through. In fact, one of the important parts of this Senate, uh, with that 60 vote margin, is that we have to work together. That said, what I see is the potential for a real boost up for the very partisan work that's being done in the House of Representatives. The Senate has been a backstop against their, I, I think we're now at around 50 attempts to repeal Obamacare, the Affordable Care Act, or yes. defund it. Um, and I think of all the other meddlesome and very partisan things that they've been doing over there. Um, now that's not true of everything they do, but uh, it, it seems that they've used more of their time to try to make partisan points than actually to move the people's business forward. And I see that as happening much less frequently in the Senate, and I would hate to see that jeopardized um, by, uh, you know, having more people in the Senate sort of in cahoots with the House Tea Party uh, members. With it not being a presidential year, it's an off year. Um, there's some punditry in Washington saying that your party's not going to fare very well. And, well, let me ask it this way. Is the Affordable Care Act a liability issue for, for Democrats who will be up on November 4th? You, of course, will not, but... Right. You know, there's so much to be uh, proud of with regard to what the uh, Affordable Care Act has brought forward. You know, the first thing I always think of is now people with pre-existing health conditions can get insurance. And Wisconsin, uh, even the governor gave uh, kudos to this, Wisconsin uh, enrolled 139,000 plus people in the federal health care uh, marketplace. Uh, our goal, our target was 79,000, so we surpassed it significantly. That is great news for people who were sort of out of the system before. Uh, seniors have preventative care. Young people can stay on their parents' health insurance. And so I think there's a lot that we really need to uh, take stock of in that act. Uh, that said, it is not perfect, and undertaking that complex never would be. And I hope that this election gives us the opportunity to move past the partisan battling on it and get to the point that we can actually address some of the issues that are still um, causing, uh, causing concerns. 
The last thing I would say when you go beyond Wisconsin and look nationally at where Senate races are, are uh, occurring, because this is a program that rests partly on cooperation from the states, and because every state health care system is very different, uh, there are probably some uh, folks who uh, will be more critical during the course of these elections. Um, if Mary Burke is elected governor, do you think she would take the, is the, is the option still available to expand yes. MA with federal dollars? Yes, indeed. You, you, you just wrote Governor Walker. He responded to you. So uh, it, would it take uh, the election of Mary Burke to get that expansion, which you think should occur? Well, I, I want to see Mary Burke elected. And uh, absolutely, um, this would be a very bright prospect for expanding Medicaid. That said, I do want to say that a number of other Republican governors across the nation, even at this late date, are rethinking their earlier refusal to expand Medicaid. We have a new Secretary of Health and Human Services as of today. Uh, we, we confirmed her yesterday in the Senate, so I hope she's being sworn in and, and all, all ready. Uh, she's ready to work with Republican governors. And so I hope we don't have to wait till November's elections to uh, help um, provide coverage, especially to those 63,000 Wisconsinites that Governor Walker kicked off Badger Care. Um, I hope we don't have to wait, but I certainly welcome uh, uh, Mary Burke's candidacy and her commitment to all of our health care. The VA scandal is a tra tragedy in many, many areas. Mm -hmm. Have you received any complaints about veterans waiting for care, either at the Madison or Toma facility, Senator? Uh, well, certainly we have a very active veterans um, advocacy uh, program within my own office. We help veterans who have encountered some sort of issue with the VA, either the health system or the disability system, on a regular basis. Uh, but since the uh, Phoenix um, uh, revelation of these incredibly long wait lists occurred, we want to try to figure out whether any of the uh, the mishandling, the purposeful concealing of waiting times was happening in Wisconsin. Uh, we went first to the VA and said, I understand you're investigating numerous facilities. Mm -hmm. Which ones are they? What states? And they weren't willing to share at that point. So what we've done is affirmatively outreached to all the county veterans service officers and said, we'd like to get your take on this. You're also close to the ground, close mm -hmm. to the veterans of Wisconsin. So we're trying to get a clearer picture. Um, but as as the uh, the federal government investigates its own VA, I really want to be sure that we're advocating for Wisconsin's veterans at every turn. Do you have any evidence that any uh, veteran in Wisconsin may have died because they didn't get timely care, Senator? I don't. Um, I do not have any evidence um, that there were any of these falsified waiting lists in Wisconsin. But that's exactly the question we want to ask, and we want honest and quick answers. So when you ask if either the Toma or the Madison facility are on the list of hospitals that are being investigated, they're not answering? They were not willing to disclose what's being, um, uh, what, what clinics are being looked at, but we have a lot of other sites across the state in addition to those large facilities that serve veterans on a routine basis. We have a Milwaukee facility, we have a Green Bay facility. Um, we're trying to find out if the veterans of every county in Wisconsin are getting the care that they need on a timely basis. And I will tell you that I've also joined on to, uh, there's now a bipartisan Senate deal. Uh, to respond directly to this issue of the wait times, but also uh, really focus in on whether the resources, the human resources, the doctors, the nurses, the uh, lab technicians are in place to make sure that every veteran gets the ser service and care that they have earned by donning the uniform. We're almost out of time, so just a couple more questions. Sure. Was the um, five Taliban for one U.S. soldier deal a fair one, Senator? Oh, that's a very, very difficult question as this story unfolds. Um, I am really troubled by uh, so much of the rush to judgment on 
something that we are learning more and more about every day, but we're also assured by so many that we won't have the full picture for a long time. I believe, uh, as our Commander-in-Chief, the President, has said, that we leave no soldier behind in the battlefield. And we, um, and so for that, I am thankful that uh, Bo Bergdahl is no longer in harm's way, is no longer uh, in captivity held by Taliban-related uh, folks. Um, but as you know, there's been a firestorm of speculation uh, that has erupted about uh, all of this, and we are uh, getting information almost on a daily basis, sometimes from the media that turns out to be inaccurate, sometimes from the media that turns out to be accurate, and from the administration, but including uh, the secret briefing that I was able to, the classified briefing, mm -hmm. it wasn't secret that it happened, but the classified briefing that I attended earlier this week, where they explained that as um, as they uh, treat uh, uh, Sergeant Bergdahl's health and uh, mental health, um, that it will be a while before they have uh, the type of conversation, detailed conversation with him, that will get us a lot of answers that we're all hoping to hear. Very quick follow-up, do you think the law was broke? Is there a question whether the law was broken that the administration should have shared this information with senators such as yourselves or Senator Feinstein? Um, I would say that I am disappointed with the lack of transparency with regard to this issue. Um, I have heard uh, the administration say in response that they feared a leak could jeopardize Sergeant Bergdahl's uh, health. Uh, no, sorry, not his health, that it could harm it, put his threat. That would be a threat to put his, him at risk. Put him at risk. Thank you. Um, and so uh, I want to evaluate that proposition. Uh, because that would lead to the conclusion that there were many other things that they couldn't share with the appropriate oversight committees. Um, and I, I would find that that would be very troubling. So I'm not happy with the administration's lack of communication or the way they've even handled it since, um, uh, since uh, Sergeant Bergdahl was uh, uh, brought out of captivity. Uh, but I think this is a longer conversation. I see. My final question is this, are you a founding member of the Hillary for President in 2016 Club? <laughs> I have many times said I am ready for Hillary. <laughs> <laughs> you are. Very good. Senator Tammy Baldwin, thanks for talking to Wisconsin. I thank have you. a good convention. Thank you. My, thank you.